Hello, I'm Dr. Paula Woodward from the University of Utah, and today I'm going to be discussing the placenta with you. Today we're going to talk about the placenta, and uh, I was also assigned the umbilical cord, but because of time, we're really going to focus on the placenta. And the placenta is really a fascinating organ in that in your entire life, it's the only organ that it's time limited and disposable. Also, it's the only organ that you actually share. It's a, both from uh, fetal and maternal origin. Uh, now, in a uh, legal dispute, the fetus would win on this because the larger portion actually is formed by the fetal chorion, but the endometrium plays a key role in the decidua basalis. The placenta has many important functions. It's a physiologic barrier. This is where all the gas nutrient exchange occurs, and it also has important endocrine functions. Now, I want to start by talking a little bit about the embryology. And we all know fertilization occurs here in the tube and cell division starts as it travels down the tube until you get this cell uh, bundle, this ball called the morula. And that morula starts to differentiate into a bottom layer and a uh, outer layer here. And that's the blastocyst. And it's this blastocyst from which the placenta will start to form the blastocyst has several layers to it. First of all, inside you have the embryo blast, all right? And that's going to be the embryo. But we really want to pay attention to the outside here, and it's got two parts to it. We have this outer smooth part, which is the cytotrophoblast, and then this inner cell layer, the syncytiotrophoblast. Now, this is a very aggressive group of cells. The membrane starts to break down between them. They're burrowing into the endometrium in a very aggressive fashion. They become multinucleated. And what have I just described? I've just described a very aggressive tumor. And this is really what this is acting like. But it is fascinating that it is limited just to the endometrium and does not go beyond at least in a normal situation. Well, what happens with that syncytiotrophoblast, it starts breaking down these little capillaries in the endometrium, and they form these little lacuna around it. And that's actually what's going to give the developing embryo nutrition until the placenta actually forms. Now, that's the syncytiotrophoblast, but then we have our cytotrophoblast, that small ring on the inside. And it starts to push out here and starts to make these little villi going all around. And that's going to be very important as the placenta starts to develop. Now, let's look at what we're seeing on ultrasound, because at this stage, we see what we call the intradecidual sac sign, and that is that little sac is buried within the decidua. Now, just a, uh, a moment about terminology. Decidua belongs to the mom. It's the endometrium. Now, as that grows, we can see, even though we don't see anything in there, there actually is a lot of important structures. We have the primary yolk sac, the secondary yolk sac, the embryo, embryoblast is right here. It's just below our level of resolution. As the sac grows, we get what we all know as the double decidual sac sign, where we have the basalis at the bottom of the sac, the capsularis forming a capsule of the sac, very good names, and the parietalis is the remaining. And that gives you the double decidual sac sign. And we can see that decidua very nicely on first trimester scan with the basalis, the capsularis, the parietalis, and this hypoechoic area between the two is the remaining endometrium. But very quickly, this wall will coapt against that one, and we have a single sac, and we never see these again. Now let's look at what's happening with that those little chorionic villi that we started to see develop. First of all, chorion is the embryonic trophoblast, all right? And the chorionic sac is really what we refer to the gestational sac. 
all right? And so there's the chorion all the way around. Well, this chorion has one job. These chorionic villi need to seek nutrition. And quickly they figure out there's not much blood supply up there, so they start to involute on that side, making the smooth chorion, and they grow down here into the decidua basalis, which has lots of flow, and that is the chorionic frondosum, or the chorion, uh, villus chorion. Now let's look inside and see what's happening with the embryo. We have another membrane that's going to start to form, and that's the amnion, and it starts as this little tiny slit right by the embryo, and as it grows, it envelops the embryo and creates a little sac around it. Now, at this point in pregnancy, we have a small little amnion around the embryo, so there is the amnion around the embryo. We have a yolk sac. Everybody loves the yolk sac. It's nice and echogenic and easy to see. The chorion is out here, and so we have a large chorionic space at this point and a very small embryonic space. Now, as the first trimester progresses, the amnion enlarges, but it's just this very thin membrane. By here, you can see the umbilical cord is already formed, very thin amnion, very thick chorion around here. The yolk sac has been jettisoned because the umbilical cord is formed. It's out there in the chorionic space. And by the end of the first trimester, the amnion and chorion approach each other, but they've not yet fused. That's an early second trimester event. Notice that the chorionic cavity is often more echogenic. It's got these very uh, thick, rich mucopolysaccharides within it that gives it this echogenic appearance. So let's now review all our membranes and everything we can see in the first trimester. And first of all, from the mom, we get the decidua. We have the parietalis, capsularis, and basalis. We have the thin little amnion around the embryo. We then have the smooth chorion on top and the villus chorion, or chorionic frondosum, at the bottom, and the villus chorion of the embryo with the decidua basalis of the mom is what gives us the placenta. When we look at an actual pathologic specimen, you can nicely see that smooth chorion where it's atrophied on the top and the villus chorion along the uh, basal surface. And we can see that when we scan. There is the chorion, our thin little amnion, and here's the thickened area, the villus chorion, and the decidua basalis, which is going to be the placenta. We can also see that cotyledons are now starting to form. Now let's look at the placenta in its more mature state. And let's go over, again, the relative contributions from the mom and the fetus. And from the fetus, we're going to see the thin amnion. We have the thick chorion, which now is called the chorionic plate, and off to the side, the amnion and chorionic membranes are fused. Off of the chorionic plate, we have the mainstream, main stem villus, and this is where all the gas exchange occurs. From the mom side, we have the myometrium and the decidua basalis, which is the, now called the basal plate. We have the septa that are project in, and they're going to uh, facilitate venous return. Between these septa, we have the cotyledons, which we saw developing in the first trimester. And then we have the intervillous space, where gas exchange and nutrient exchange is going to occur. When we look at the mature placenta here, here's the chorionic plate that has all the fetal vessels on it and the ba uh, basal plate, which is the maternal contribution of the uh, decidua basalis. Just a word about circulation. The circulation and nutrition exchange occurs at this main stem villus. The maternal arterial blood comes in here under pressure, and it makes a little spark spurt into this uh, intervillous space, and it circulates blood around so that once it goes past the villus, 
gas exchange occurs, then the deoxygenated blood comes into this intravillous septa. The point here being, this is a very vascular area with a lot of high flow in it, and that's something to be aware of when we start to talk about accretas later. All right, what are some things that we can see with the placenta at, during development? In the first trimester, one that we need to be aware of is the chorionic bump. The chorionic bump is felt to be a little arterial bleed uh, and uh, on the chorionic plate side. Uh, sometimes you can actually see swirling blood in these when you look at real time. The key is that there is an association with pregnancy loss. If you don't see an embryo at the time of the scan, there's about a 50% loss. Uh, if you have a live embryo, there's still about a 20% loss. So a chorionic bump is something that we will bring a patient back for in anywhere from one to three weeks, depending on how big it is and what other things we see. The other thing we can see in the first trimester is the perigestational hemorrhage, and, and you are very comfortable with these. They're very common, about 3%, and honestly, I think it's probably higher than that. Uh, it seems like we see these a lot. Often patients are asymptomatic and don't even realize that they have one. And they can go anywhere in size. Here's a small one. Here's a larger one. This one obviously resulted in a miscarriage. The chance of loss goes up as the size of this goes up with about a 20% loss for large, with large being defined as greater than 50% of the sac size. But even those that don't have a loss, it's important to realize that later in pregnancy, they can have uh, other symptoms. There's a high incidence of perigestational hemorrhage in uh, people who eventually uh, develop preeclampsia. There's fetal growth restriction, hypertension, etc. Now, if we move into the second trimester, hemorrhages around the placenta we refer to as abruptions. And abruptions can occur in a number of locations. The most common is at the edge of the placenta, and we'll uh, call these marginal abruptions. Often they're not a big deal. Here's a little one we saw here. Uh, no problems, no symptoms in this pregnancy. You can get preplacental hemorrhages. When you get those, they're most often around the cord insertion, and how they do really depends upon their effect on the umbilical cord. If they cause any mass effect and decrease in perfusion, that can be an issue. The ones that we really worry about, though, are the retroplacental hemorrhages. And here was a large retroplacental abruption where most of the placenta was torn away. Uh, this ended in uh, pregnancy loss. Uh, but really what you're concerned about is how much of the placenta myometrial surface is still intact. Placenta position is very interesting. The placenta continues to grow about the first half of pregnancy until it takes up anywhere from, oh, 25 to 30 percent of, of the uterine surface. Now, it has a very fascinating um, uh, growth called trophotropism. And some people call this dynamic placentation. I think of it as kind of a giant, slow-moving amoeba that the placenta really wants a good blood supply. So it doesn't really want to be down at the cervix. The cervix doesn't have decidua. It doesn't have a good blood supply. So the placenta wants to grow into the area where it has a good blood supply, and then atrophy in the areas of a poor blood supply. Now, this has been known forever, and if you look at some of the traditional uh, Chinese therapies uh, for previa, they used acupuncture and herbs that they thought would stimulate blow to the fundus. Also, some of these, uh, these very old texts uh, say to refrain from sexual stimulation or an orgasm because they don't want flow uh, going down to the uh, lower areas. Now, in addition to documenting placental uh, position, we always want to document placental umbilical cord insertion, and you always want to do that in two planes. Because uh, if you look in just one plane, uh, you may be misled to thinking it is central when it's really off to the edge.
The central and eccentric probably are, uh, the eccentric probably is of no significance, but once you get to marginal, we really need to follow these because if the placenta regresses from this edge, it can turn into a villamentous cord insertion. And villamentous cord insertions have higher uh, morbidity, they're more often associated with fetal growth restriction. So here we are, you want to document, again, in both planes so that you're sure it is absolutely in the correct position. Here is one at 17 weeks that we see inserts right at the edge of the placenta. Now, by 32 weeks, it's actually placenting under the membranes here and then going under the membranes to go in. So we've change from a marginal insert, excuse me, a very marginal insert, to a velamentous insert. And you can see that on the gross specimen. And you can see these uh, are uncovered vessels. Uh, these fetuses often have a higher incidence of growth restriction, particularly if you see twins that are sharing a placenta. The other thing that can happen with uh, placental uh, changes is a suction curate lobe can develop. So here at 19 weeks, we can see here is the placenta. It's rather thinned in this area. By 26 weeks, it's very thinned. And by 33 weeks, it almost like, looks like two different ones. And when you look at path, you can see connecting vessels between this, but it's really thin thinned out into just membranes in between this main mass, and actually it looks like two little lobes there. Placenta previa. Now, uh, this has caused some confusion in terminology. I think everybody was very comfortable on a complete previa that we see here. But this is where people got confused in terminology. Some people call these marginal, partial, low-lying. Uh, actually, uh, partial and marginal came from actually physical exam. And so there was an effort made and an executive summary put out in uh, 2014 that has unified this language. We've gotten rid of marginal and partial, and we just either call these uh, placenta previa if it covers the os or low lying with its in two centimeters. Now why two centimeters? Well if you look at the data it really does support that because greater than two centimeters there's really no indication for a c-section. Between uh, 10 to 2 there's a low likelihood of c-section and some um, of your uh, the MFMs will watch these and allow them a trial labor, see how they do, but counsel them for possible c-section. And less than 10, they are all going to go on to c-section. Now, following these, again, here is trophotropism in action that most of these will resolve, most of these low-lying ones. And as to when to follow them, we tend to bring ours back at 32 weeks. There's no point following these every couple weeks because it's a slow process. But by 32 weeks, about 90% will resolve, and by 36 weeks, 96%. Here's an example of the importance of looking at where the cord is inserting. So here we have a placenta previa. It's covering the cervix, as you can see. And that has a high likelihood of resolving. But if I go just barely to the side, I can see the cord is actually inserting in a very eccentric fashion, really right on the margin. And as this resolves, you can be left with vessels covering the os, and that is called a vasoprevia. And this is very important to recognize because this is a life-threatening situation if you don't make the diagnosis. So you can see here on our schematic that the vessels are covering the os in a, in a velamentous situation and then inserting into the placenta. I think it's imperative on every one of your uh, cervix pictures when you're clearing what was low-lying and the cord was anywhere near it that you put color Doppler on. And when you color, put color Doppler on, if you put the pulse wave, you can see that's a fetal heartbeat and that was a uh, fetal arterial vessel going right over the cervix in vasoprevia.
The other way you can get vasa previa is in the setting of a suction curate lobe. As the placenta thins out in this area because the blood supply is poor, it doesn't really want to be there. It leaves a chunk of placenta on this side, another one on this side, and you put Doppler on and you see we have an arteri uh, fetal arterial flow. And look at these big ropes of vessels going between the main placenta and the suction curate lobe. So this is a potentially life-threatening situation if you don't make the diagnosis. We know there are pitfalls and everybody that's in the audience has seen the problem with over distension and contractions, and in this case there was both. Uh, the tip-off is the cervix is way too long. You know in your heart of hearts that it is ending right here, but you wait a little bit, let the contraction uh, go down, let the mom void, and you can see the placenta ends nowhere near the cervix. All right, so this is kind of our background on cervix. I do want to talk about some specific masses that we can see. We can see both solid masses and sonolucencies. Uh, of the solid masses, we're going to start with the chorioangioma. Uh, it's a solid, uh, usually hypoechoic mass. It's very vascular. Often if they're small, it's no big deal. Uh, but if large, the fetus can develop hydrops. Now, I think that's straightforward. The more unusual one is when you get chorioangiomatosis, which are multiple small masses in the uterus. As you can see here, multiple small masses. This really does have a high association with complications, including polyhydrops and growth restriction. An unusual solid mass that you can see is the placental teratoma. This is somewhat controversial because it has a lot of features uh, in common with a trap twin and a cardiac twin. Uh, you can see it's kind of an amorphous blob, often cystic areas. You'll get calcifications in, very much like a trap twin. The difference is a trap twin will be floating out in the amnion, and this is between the amnion and chorion, trapped between the membranes, and it's fed off of the placental vessel. You can see here the placenta is actually coming up and going around this. Sonolucencies are common, aren't they? We all see them. Uh, we uh, often refer to these as lakes, and sometimes you can have this nice gentle lake, and we're all happy, uh, everything's fine. Sometimes you can see a lot of lakes, and that gets our attention. And then you can see some really scary lakes, and that should really get our attention. So let's start with those nice placid lakes. We see these all the time, don't we? Uh, often you can see fl uh, low flow on uh, grayscale, and this is uh, just a uh, blood-filled lacoon. But the more you get of these, when they thrombose, when you get fibrin, there's really a high association with growth restriction. This was a mom with uh, hypertension and a severely growth restricted fetus. If the placenta is big, and you have lakes, there are a couple things that we should think of. And one is mesenchymal dysplasia. And what this is, these are very abnormal villi and stroma, and they're very uh, hydropic in appearance. The placenta will be very thick. You can see cysts. The fetuses are often growth restricted. We can have abnormal Dopplers here. They'll often be associated with preeclampsia. When you look at the placenta, you can see these little bubbles, these little cysts, and those represent these very hydropic villi. Now, mesenchymal dysplasia does not have an association with aneuploidy, but the thing that you need to realize, it does have about a 20% association with Beckwith-Wiedemann. And just to remind you, the features of Beckwith-Wiedemann include omphalocele, organomegaly, including hepatomegaly, and nephromegaly is often one of the most obvious features that we see in a fetus, and macroglossia, with the tongue being able to, enabled to be uh, retracted into the mouth. Here's a fetus who didn't, or excuse me, a newborn who didn't happen to have an omphalocele, 
was macrosomic, a huge abdomen from uh, both hepatomegaly and nephromegaly, and this little guy was never able to retract the tongue. And in fact, a tracheostomy uh, was placed, which you can see right here. The one that we think about with a cystic placenta is triploidy, uh, isn't it? So uh, everybody's aware of this, but the thing I want to point out is not all triploidy is equal. It depends really where you get the extra set of chromosomes. If you get the extra set of chromosomes from the dad, the placenta will be large and cystic. You get very, usually very severe symmetric growth restriction, and the ovaries will often be enlarged with uh, thecalunian cysts. If it comes from the mom, you're not going to see the cystic placenta. Now, this is the minority, but still possible. And they get an asymmetric growth restriction. So uh, here is the classic one from the dad, the diandric, the cystic-looking placenta. There was a very growth-restricted abnormal fetus. There were thecalunian cysts. And when you look at the placenta, it has the multiple small cysts throughout it. And now I'm going to end with the really scary sonolucencies. Uh, and these we refer to as these tornado vessels. The, everybody, you can recognize them when you see them. They're very irregular. They're often linear. They often have very high flow. And this makes us worry for placenta accreta. Now, this is really in a spectrum from an accreta, meaning attached to an invasive increta to perforated through the wall percreta. But I'll tell you, we have no chance making these subtle differentiations, particularly accreta and increta. And even the pathologists can't make these often. And we have gone to talking about these as morbidly adherent placenta. Uh, some people call these placental attachment disorders. In my uh, institution, we call them morb morbidly adherent placenta. Now, the risk factors for developing this are C-section scar and placenta previa. And the, as the number of C-section scars go up, the likelihood of developing an accreta goes up. What are we going to see on ultrasound? Well, obviously, we're going to look at previa. We're going to look at these scary tornado vessels. Uh, we're going to look at the myometrium, at the retroplacental uh, clear zone. Uh, but I'll tell you something. This can be hard. And I just want to go through a few findings with you. And I really think the most important thing is to look really, really carefully at the placental myometrial interface. And here on this endovaginal scan, you can follow that hypochoic zone, and then you completely lost it. On this transabdominal scan, again, there's the myometrium. You've completely lost it. We have a little bit more. We completely lose it there. Now, Technique is important in all things. It is never more important than when trying to make this diagnosis. I always use a nine linear. Look at the difference between this four vector and nine linear. You want to make sure you go the entire length of the scar and you look for these little areas of invasion. And that, I think, is the single most important thing you can do. One another thing that you can see, just kind of on the big scale, is the placenta always looks kind of funny. You'll get kind of this bulge, but it bulges in both directions. It, so the placenta looks just like a little ball sitting down there. It's not normal looking. So I find that very helpful. Uh, you need to be scrupulous in your technique. Here is no pressure. This patient hasn't even had a uh, C-section. But look, when you put pressure on the transducer, you lose that clear space. And don't go crazy with the color. Oh my goodness. This is what people do, is you'll put Doppler on there and just like freak out because of all this flow. Well, this person hasn't even had a C-section. That is just normal placenta. So 
I know this is something that's described, but vascularity is very subjective. And unless you're looking at a lot of normals, you're not going to recognize an abnormal. And by the way, these are all normals. These are not accretives. And remember that basal plate has a lot of flow within it. So here is an accreta case, and everybody looks at that and goes, oh, yeah, look at all that flow. Well, to me, that doesn't really look much different than any of the other normal ones I showed you. What matters to me is looking here on my high-res endovaginal scan and looking, I've completely lost my hypoechoic zone. Other things that are described, turbulent gaps, bridging vessels, uh, and here's an accreta case, and everybody looks at this and goes, oh yeah, look how scary. This one doesn't help me. Back off on the flow. And what helps me is actually not how much flow, but what it looks like. And we don't have that smooth arc that we see in normals. I kind of like looking for the little gaps in the flow. And then also, these are all very high velocity because I've cut way back on my gain. Uh, this was not a diagnostic dilemma in this patient because they were, had, you look at the Foley, what's being put out in the bag here. Again, what really helps me is my gray scale. I'm looking at the bladder here and I can see here's the placenta. It looks to transverse and go up into the bladder uh, wall, and now I have these traversing vessels on my color, uh, and uh, then you can put it all together, but really depend on your grayscale. Uh, one, another pitfall I really want to warn you about is bladder varices, okay? They're very common. This patient hasn't even had a C-section, but we see this in the bladder. This one did have a C-section, it was sent to us for invasion. Well, it's not invasion at all. There's great myometrium, and we do see flow in here, but those are just little bladder varices that are very common in pregnancy. So you've got to look at the entire uh, picture. All right, well, so that was a very cursory view of the placenta. Uh, and when you look at the placenta, give it some love. You've got to really look around and look for all of these various features. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Dr. Peter Michael Dubele uh, from Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School in Boston. I'll be speaking on ultrasound of the placenta, umbilical cord, and amniotic fluid. I'll be spending the next 45 minutes talking about ultrasound of the placenta, umbilical cord, and amniotic fluid. Uh, these are the parts of the pregnancy uh, that don't go home with the, uh, with the mother or parents. Uh, after all, it's just the baby that uh, does go home with them. But um, the placenta, cord, and fluid are very important in terms of uh, uh, promoting uh, the uh, and ensuring the health of the baby, uh, and also um, uh, the uh, well-being of the uh, of the mother, especially during delivery. So let's begin with the placenta. The uh, main uh, items that we can diagnose on ultrasound related to the placenta are placenta previa, placenta abruption, placenta accreta, increta, percreta, and chorioangioma. For all of these uh, elements, uh, especially the first two, I'm going to talk not only about how to make the diagnosis by ultrasound, but uh, at least as importantly, how to avoid some of the pitfalls that can lead to errors in uh, diagnosis on ultrasound. The uh, first item that I'm going to talk about is uh, placenta previa and the terminology that we use in ultrasound uh, for placenta previa. Uh, 
some of the terms that uh, uh, are used uh, at least sometimes are placenta previa, marginal previa, partial previa, complete previa, low-lying placenta. So how and when do we use them? Do we use all of them? Uh, what I'll be talking about over the next couple of slides is uh, how we have uh, decided uh, uh, in my own practice to uh, use these terms, which terms to use and when to use them. If you take the uh, view of the, plac of the placenta uh, and, the, uh, and the cervix the way the fetus might look at it, looking from the inside, especially if the fetus had x-ray vision to look through the placenta at the, uh, at the cervix, if the placenta covers all or part of the cervix. Uh, the image on the left shows um, what would be a complete preview. So this overall gray area here that I'm outlining is uh, the placenta, as would be seen by the baby. And if the baby had x-ray vision, this is the cervix, and this little dot is the internal os that's closed. So this would be a complete preview. The placenta completely covers the cervix. A marginal preview is the term for what would happen if the baby is looking and sees the placenta that covers part of the cervix. This part of the cervix up here is not covered. This part that you see as a dotted line is covered. And the placenta comes right about to the internal loss, which is again a closed dot in the usual situation. A partial previa is uh, a, um, uh, somewhat similar to the marginal previa, but is the case when, or apply, that term applies when the internal loss is open or dilated. So this is the dilated internal loss, that is the entire cervix. The cervix is partially covered by the placenta, but uh, in addition, the open cervical os is partially covered by the placenta. Um, this uh, partial previa is something that is not generally relevant to ultrasound. Rarely it is, but when we do ultrasound, in almost all cases, the uh, uh, internal os is closed. And if you have a closed internal os, you can't partially cover a dot, so you can't have a partial previa. So the terms that we use in ultrasound are complete previa and marginal previa. Um, and uh, the, this table, the first uh, site looks a little complicated. It's not really that complicated. Uh, indicates when we use the, uh, the uh, terms previa or marginal previa uh, in ultrasound. So the key, uh, this is a uh, diagram of the uh, pregnant uh, uterus. There's the baby. There's the black is the amniotic fluid. There's the placenta. There's the cervix. Um, what's key in terms of our diagnosis is a uh, close-up view of this area where the, the relationship between the placenta and the cervix. So here it is blown up right over here on this image. This is the, the gray area here is the cervix. The little uh, white, uh, the dark line is the uh, cervical canal that's closed. The end of it is the internal os. And what's critical is the distance between the internal os and the edge of the placenta when it comes to uh, using the terms related to placenta previa. So that distance is key. And uh, the way that we use it is shown in the table on the right. Um, when, if the distance from the internal os, from the placenta to the internal os, is over 20 millimeters or 2 centimeters, then we say no previa at any age, 16 to 24 weeks or more than 24 weeks, that's no previa. If at the bottom, if the placenta completely covers the os, we call it a previa or a complete previa in those situations. When it's close, but not there, so uh, 
when the distance from the placenta to the internal os is uh, 0 to 20 millimeters or 0 to 2 centimeters. Uh, from 16 to 24 weeks, we call it a low-lying placenta. And uh, after 24 weeks, we distinguish between um, uh, a low-lying placenta, we use the term if it's 11 to 20 millimeters, and if it's 0 to 10 millimeters, we call it a marginal previa. And I'll show some examples of all of these on the next several slides. So here you can see we're measured from uh, the internal loss to the edge of the placenta. It's measuring three, just over three centimeters. Since it's over 20 millimeters, that's no previa at any stage. Here we have a distance from the os to the placenta of 15.6 millimeters, 1.56 centimeters. And so that's in the 11 to 20 millimeter range. We would call it low-lying at any age, 16 weeks on up. Here, there's virtually no distance. It's a roughly zero or one millimeter from the placental edge and the cervical os. So that's in the zero to 10 millimeter range. We would call it low-lying, 16 to 24 weeks, and marginal previa at uh, 24 weeks or beyond. And finally, and this is uh, a transabdominal view, the prior were transvaginal views. The, there is the cervix. The placenta completely covers it. This is a uh, placenta previa or a complete previa at any age. So those are the uh, basic uses of uh, the terminology. Um, important now to look at are some of the potential pitfalls or errors that can be made in diagnosing uh, placenta previa. So one pitfall is when the fetal presenting part, which is usually the head, obscures the lower uterine segment. If it shadows out part of the cervix or the lower uterine segment, that may lead to inability to diagnose or exclude a placenta previa. And uh, in those cases, if we were to just say the fetal head is blocking our view, can't tell if there's a previa or not, we wouldn't be doing much good. It would be a, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, uh, give uh, definitive and accurate diagnoses to say we can't tell uh, is not doing anybody any, much go uh, any good. So what can we do if the head shadows out the uh, cervix. Well, here you can see two images, two different uh, pregnancies, two different fetuses. In both cases, the head shadows out at least part of the cervix. Here, these are transabdominal views. There's the fetal head, casts a shadow down here. The cervix would be somewhere around here. We have no idea from this image whether there's a previa or not. Similarly, in this case, this is uh, sagittal view low. There's the baby's head, a little bit of amniotic fluid. You can see part of the cervix, part of it is shadowed. We just can't see things well enough to decide whether or not there's a previa. So what do we do? Do we send the uh, patient away and report that we can't tell? Well, again, that wouldn't be doing anybody any good. We, but fortunately, there are things that we can do to get an answer. So what we would do in these cases is um, uh, try and push the baby's head up. And in, as you'll see in a minute, um, uh, in both of these cases, I was scanning with my right hand. I used my left hand to try and lift the baby's head. And once the head was lifted out of the uh, lower uterus, I could tell. So watch what happens on the image on the left when I push push and the head goes up and when the head is up and away like right now there's no placenta. So by pushing up we get an answer to is there a placenta previa? The answer is no, no previa. On the other case when we push up there's the placenta right over at least part of the cervix. So this is a placenta previa, at least a marginal maybe even a full previa. So it's a previous. So we answered the question by manually lifting the fetal head.
So if you can lift the head, you can avoid the pitfall of having to give a uh, non-definitive uh, diagnosis where you just say you can't tell. Another potential problem or pitfall is an overly full uh, maternal bladder. The overly full bladder may push together, squeeze together the anterior and posterior walls of the lower uterine segment, which can simulate the cervix and lead to a false positive diagnosis of placenta previa. And here is such a case. Uh, here on this image, this is a transabdominal view. There's the placenta, amniotic fluid. This looks like the cervix, and if so, the placenta is covering a good part of it, right about to where you'd expect the os to be. So this would be at least a marginal previa. Um, but um, the uh, reason that you have to be very careful here that you're not making a mistake is that the bladder is extremely full. And if the bladder is extremely full, maybe this is not all the cervix, maybe some of this is the uterus pressed together. So what do we do? We have the woman partially empty her bladder, and when that's done, here we've gone to a partially empty bladder, and now you can see the placenta, which ends right around here, is well away from the cervix. There's no previa. So this was, uh, this image you could call a pseudo previa, or pseudo placenta previa, due to an overfilled maternal bladder. Yet another pitfall in diagnosing placenta previa is uh, when there's a lower uterine segment contraction, which distorts the lower uterine segment near the cervix and can, call, can cause a false, false positive diagnosis of placenta previa, as you'll see in a minute on, this, uh, on one of these cases. So here are two different pregnancies. They both look quite similar, and at first sight, you would think that you're looking at a placenta previa. Um, so on this case, here's the placenta. This is, you'd think, is the cervix, and the placenta covers, uh, you know, at least uh, some of it, if not all of it. Uh, so you'd think there's a previa. Similarly here, there's the placenta. The internal os, you might think, is right around here. So it's covering it or coming right up to it. Another previa, you would think. But you have to be very careful on both of these cases and on cases like them. Note that you have these rounded, bunched up areas just uh, adjacent to the cervix, right here and here. On this image, a big bulge here and a smaller bulge here. When you see these bulges, you're dealing with uterine contractions. And when you're dealing with uterine contractions, um, you can't tell whether there's a preview. Everything is distorted. So what do you have to do? Well, don't even try to determine whether there's a preview on these pictures. Don't spend any time. You just can't tell. What you have to do when this happens is wait a few minutes for the contraction to go away. And then when the contraction goes away, you'll be able to tell whether it's a preview or not. Here's what happened on these two different cases when we waited for the uh, contraction to go away. Here on the case on the left, contract, this looked like a previa, but when the contraction went away, there's the cervix, placenta ends here, it's not a previa. On this case, it looked similar during the contraction. When the contraction goes away, you can see that the placenta covers part of the uh, cervix right up to almost to the cervix, uh, almost up to the internal os. So this is a low-lying or marginal placenta previa. So uh, the way to avoid the pitfall of, an, of a uterine contraction is to recognize that it's present by seeing these rounded um, bulges by the cervix and waiting for them to go away. So in these cases, the lower uterine segment uh, contraction does not permit assessment for placenta previa. So when we want to get an answer to uh, the uh, question of whether or not there's a placenta previa, we begin by scanning transvaginally, sorry, transabdominally through a partially full bladder, um, uh, the partially full for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Um, 
and uh, not a full bladder. If the baby, especially the head, obscures the lower uterine segment, try to manually lift the head. And if you are unable to lift the head, we go right to a transvaginal scan to uh, take a look at the relationship between the placenta and the cervix. We used to scan transabdominally, but um, we have stopped doing so in recent years. And if we can't lift the baby's head and it's in the way, we go right to a transvaginal scan. Let's move from placenta previa to placental abruption. The are, there are three main ultrasound appearances with a placenta abruption. One is seeing a hematoma under the placenta between the placenta and the wall of the uterus. That's the wall of the uterus here. That's the placenta, that's the hematoma. A second appearance of a placental abruption is a hematoma that extends mostly under the membranes. Here's the membrane, placenta extends under it. A bit of it is under the, uh, sorry, the hematoma extends under it. A bit of the hematoma is under the placenta, but, uh, or even in some other case, it may be all under the membranes. That's another, th uh, appearance that you can have of a placental abruption. A third appearance, and this is the one you have to be careful about, is that an ultrasound can look completely normal with a placental abruption. Uh, for example, if, no, if the placenta separates from the uterine wall, which is an abruption, but no hematoma collects, the ultrasound is likely to be completely normal. And you don't have to have a hematoma to have a, an abruption. So here is uh, an example of a retroplacental hematoma. This whiter area is the placenta. This dark area is the amniotic fluid. But this dark area beh uh, behind the placenta is a hematoma. So this is an abruption with a retroplacental hematoma. This is the submembranous version of the hematoma. Here. This area right here is the hematoma. Most of it is just under the membranes. A little bit of it raises up the edge of the uh, placenta. Um, okay, so what are the pitfalls in diagnosis of uh, placental abruption? So one is that uh, if it happens that the hematoma is isoechoic to the placenta, has the same echo pattern, and uh, echogenicity as the placenta, it may be difficult or impossible to see. Uh, um, a hematoma that is uh, uh, isoechoic to the placenta can be mistaken for the placenta, leading one to miss an abruption. And here's an example. If you look at this, at first sight, it looks like there's no abruption, no problem. This is a sagittal view through the fundus of the uh, uterus. The placenta looks like goes around the fundus like so, and like so. But uh, the person doing the scan was very observant, and they said, you know, that this area here looks different than the rest of the placenta. Similarly, this area looks different than the rest of the placenta. Maybe it's not the placenta, maybe it's a hematoma. So they did two things. They threw color on, they turned the color on, which shows that in the part that clearly looks like it's the placenta, there is color flow. In the part that looks different, there's no color flow. They also watched while the baby pushed up against it, and you can see that the placenta is um, uh, quite soft, soft, uh, sorry, this area that you would first think of as a placenta is quite soft, kind of like a hematoma. Well, they said, there's, based on these, even though at first sight you'd think it was normal, they said there's probably a hematoma, and sure enough, five days later, you can see that hematoma is starting to break down, and it clearly is a uh, hematoma. So don't uh, uh, so be careful not to miss isoechoic hematomas. Another pitfall in diagnosis of uh, abruption are uterine contractions. Uterine contraction under the placenta 
can simulate a hematoma, thereby leading to the false positive diagnosis of placental abruption. Um, so let's uh, look at this image. Uh, when you first look at it, you'd say, ooh, I think there's a uh, placental abruption. The edge of the placenta here looks like it's lifted off the wall. And this, at first sight, you might say, that's a uh, hematoma, so the patient has an abruption. But if you look at it more carefully, the texture of this doesn't look like a hematoma. And in fact, it looks pretty close to that of the wall. The, uh, you might suspect that it's not an abruption, that this, or a hematoma, that this is instead a uh, contraction. So if you're not sure, there's an easy way to tell. Wait a few minutes. After a few minutes, you can see that this area clearly was a contraction because it's all gone. It looks completely normal. So this is a normal scan with no abruption, but the contraction could have fooled you for it. Another very important uh, diagnosis not to miss on ultrasound is a placenta accreta or increta or percreta. They are a continuum uh, in which there's abnormal adherence of the placenta to the myometrium. With a placenta accreta, the, uh, the, there's abnormal adherence without invasion of the villi into the myometrium itself, but it adheres abnormally, won't come off normally at delivery. With placenta increta, there's invasion of the villi into, but not all the way through the myometrium. And with a percreta, the villi penetrate all the way through the uh, myometrium. Placenta accretas, or their variants, are caused by partial or complete absence of the endometrium, which turns into the decidua during pregnancy. Normally, in a normal case situation, the endometrium prevents the placenta from coming in contact with the myometrium. If there is damage to the endometrium uh, and damage, therefore damage to the decidua, the uh, placenta can come in direct contact with or even grow into the myometrium, which leads to placenta accreta. And this uh, uh, can occurs typically when the placenta implants at a site of damaged endometrium. One of the most common causes of damaged endometrium these days is a cesarean section scar. So if you have a placenta that comes down over a cesarean section scar, it can, that placenta can touch the myometrium or even grow into it. And the complications of uh, placenta accreta and the other family members, increta or percreta, are difficulty removing the placenta after delivery, um, such that tugging on that placenta may tear it and cause dangerous bleeding to the mother. Uh, there can also be bleeding at delivery which uh, can be so heavy as to necessitate hysterectomy. Also, with an increta or percreta, that area of the uterine wall is weakened by the placenta growing in, which can lead to uterine rupture, or you can have internal hemorrhage with a percreta. Um, the, in a woman who's had one or more prior C-sections, in the past, and now she's pregnant again, and in her current pregnancy, the placenta lies over the scar, which usually happens with an anterior placenta previa. Um, then the, uh, the, the woman is at uh, substantially increased risk of an accreta, increta, or procreta if the placenta lies over the area of a prior C-section scar. If a woman has had one prior C-section, and the placenta uh, implants over that area, she has a one in four chance, a 24% chance of having a placenta accreta. If she's had two or more prior, uh, two or more prior C sections and the placenta implants over that area, over the lower uterine segment scar, she has a fi almost 50% chance of having an accreta. So anytime you see a woman with an anterior placenta previa or a low-lying placenta in a woman with prior cesarean sections, 
you should always raise the question or the possibility of a placenta accreta. That's regardless of what the ultrasound shows other than a previa or low-lying placenta. Just the fact that it overlies the scar means that uh, if she's had a prior C-section, means that she has a good chance of having an accreta. If you see that, namely the placenta overlies the region of the scar in a woman with prior C-sections, and on top of that, the myometrium looks very thin over the placenta, or there's no myometrium seen over the placenta, that indicates an almost certain placenta accreta. And if the placenta extends through the uterine wall, for example, into the bladder, um, then there are, uh, the, the, then you've diagnosed the placenta percreta. Another uh, finding that often goes along with an accreta, increta, or percreta are large, irregular, placental, venous lakes. So if you're thinking about the diagnosis, that should help you be more certain. Here's an example of a placenta accreta. Here is the placenta, and at least in this region, we see no myometrium around it. Um, and you can also see that uh, there are large irregular venous lakes in the uh, placenta, some of which fill in with color Doppler. So this is a placenta accreta, at least an accreta, and this woman ended up having a hysterectomy at, uh, during delivery to control her bleeding, um, and a pathologic examination confirmed the diagnosis of a placenta accreta or increta. Here's a percreta where the, this is a sagittal view, that's the fetal, uh, that's the mother's bladder, and here is the uh, uterus, and you can see here, sorry, here is the placenta. You can see the placenta is growing all the way through the wall and looks like placental tissue. It's coming into contact with urine in the mother's bladder, and that was confirmed at pathology. Pre, uh, accretas don't have to happen and don't always happen or don't only happen in the lower uterine segment at C-section scars. They can occur anywhere in some cases. Um, uh, uh, here is a case of a woman who had a prior DNC, which presumably damaged her endometrium, which led to a placenta accreta in the fundus. Uh, for normal comparison, you can see here is the placenta, somewhat calcified placenta, and here is the hypochoic myometrium overlying it. In distinction, this case also up in the fundus, there's the placenta, uh, but at a, at a part of the placenta, you see no overlying myometrium, no myometrium between the placenta and the bright uh, echogenic um, tissue outside the uterus. So this is a placenta accreta or worse um, in uh, a woman with, uh, uh, who has her accreta not at the lower segment. Placental chorioangiomas are, uh, occur in about a half to one percent at uh, when the placenta is looked at pathologically. It's a benign tumor, benign quite vascular tumor of the placenta. We often don't see them, especially late in pregnancy, because the placenta is heterogeneous. If it's heterogeneous, the uh, uh, chorioangioma may not stand out that clearly. Uh, but if, the, if it's earlier in pregnancy and a chorioangioma is there, uh, as we'll see in a minute, they can be quite, they're, they're usually quite easy to see. Most of them have no clinical significance. Occasionally, if they are larger or have very high blood flow, uh, you can have complications including uh, polyhydramnios, uh, thrombocytopenia, hemolytic anemia, um, and intrauterine growth restriction. And here's an example of a placental chorioangioma. The placenta is mostly quite homogeneous, but there's a focal hypochoic area right here that has quite a lot of blood flow on the color Doppler view. Um, this is a uh, chorioangioma. As I mentioned, they usually are cause no problems, but when they're big, and here's another chorioangioma, there's the end of the placenta, large 
um, chorioangioma, environment of blood flow. They can lead to fetal hydrops in some cases. Um, and here we see the early phase of hydrops, which is a dilated umbilical vein. And this is due to vascular steel phenomenon through the um, chorioangioma. Okay, let's move from the uh, placenta to the umbilical cord. Here's a nice 3D view of a fetus at about uh, 12 weeks where we can see the cord looping away from the baby at the uh, umbilicus seen here to the, um, uh, to the edge of the uh, uterus actually at the placenta. And here's a uh, color uh, 2D video clip of the uh, placenta with the two umbilical arteries. There are a number of uh, abnormalities that we can uh, uh, see in the umbilical cord. I'll be talking about some of them, but not all of them here because of time limitations. One of the key ones is to determine the structure of the cord. The normal structure of the cord is that uh, normally it has three vessels, one vein and two umbilical arteries, one umbilical vein, two umbilical arteries. The difference in appearance is that the vein is big and the in cross-section the artery is small. And we can see that uh, on the normal case here where you see a loop of cord surrounded by fluid. Uh, this larger black area is the umbilical vein. Two smaller uh, black areas are the two umbilical arteries in cross-section. We can see it by turning color Doppler on the arteries, the two arteries in the vein, but not necessary. Um, to see it. We can see it perfectly well in the 2D. Uh, this indistinction is the, as an abnormal two-vessel cord or a single umbilical artery. There's one vein, one artery instead of one vein, two arteries. This is an abnormal cord. Also confirmed by uh, color Doppler where you see the vein and one artery. If you can't isolate a loop of cord to get a good cross-section of it, and the, as I showed on the prior slide, you can get another, way, there's another way of telling whether there's one umbilical artery or two umbilical arteries, and that is to do, use color Doppler through the fetal pelvis. Here, uh, fetal pelvis, there's the fetal bladder, and you can see by color Doppler, two arteries. This is normal. So it's a two umbilical artery or a three vessel cord. Three VC is three vessel cord. Here on the other hand, there's the bladder and on color Doppler, there is one umbilical artery but none on the other side. This is a single umbilical artery or a two vessel cord. Now why is it important to know if there's a two vessel cord instead of a one? Well, uh, this abnormality, which occurs in up to 1% of singletons and quite a bit more commonly in twins, um, is important only because uh, there is a fairly high chance in a fetus with a single umbilical artery that that fetus has structural anomalies or aneuploidy, abnormal chromosomes, up to about 30%. So when you see a um, single umbilical artery, it's important to, uh, to be, take a very, very, very careful look at the rest of the baby. Umbilical cord cysts can be seen in any trimester, first, second, third. They usually cause no problems. But there have been associated uh, or reported association of umbilical cord cysts with fetal anomalies, including emphalocele, cardiac or renal anomalies, uh, and they've been associated with aneuploidy. Here are a few examples. First trimester, there's uh, the head and body of the fetus, a bit of the umbilical cord, and there's a cyst in part of the cord. Here is another case. Uh, this is in the uh, late second trimester, and what we're seeing is there's the fetal abdomen. That's uh, actually the fetal bladder. You can see a little bit of normal cord, and then in this part of the cord here, there are uh, two big cysts. There's one, there's the other. On color Doppler, the cord vessels light up, the cysts do not. Umbilical cord varics is a focal dilatation of the uh, umbilical cord that can occur within the fetal abdomen or in the umbilical cord, usually in the fetal abdomen, and it also is uh, 
been associated with an elevated risk of structural anomaly, anomalies, uh, aneuploidy, and other problems, including fetal demise, possibly because the, the blood flowing flows slowly in the, um, in the varix in the dilated vein and may thrombose. And here's a, an example of an umbilical vein varix. The umbilical vein is normal here. Then it balloons way out, and then it's normal again. And here you can see on color Doppler uh, that it lights up with color. The, uh, another ultrasound feature of the umbilical cord is where the cord inserts into the placenta. Normally, the cord inserts, if this is the placenta, and this is the umbilical cord, normally it, it uh, inserts somewhere at or around the middle of the cord. If it occurs at the edge of the cord, it is a marginal insertion. And uh, if instead of uh, coming out into the amniotic fluid as soon as it leaves the placenta, if it travels under the membranes for a while and then only later, after traveling through the membranes for a while, comes into the amniotic fluid. That's called a velamentous cord insertion, or sometimes termed a membranous cord insertion. Um, and with these, uh, these are also associated with uh, an elevated risk of uh, problems. Um, probably, or it's thought to be, because this, the umbilical cord normally is in the amniotic fluid, and when it travels through the amniotic fluid, it's uh, protected by what's called Wharton's jelly. This part of the cord that's under the membranes is not protected by Wharton's jelly, and it's thought to be a greater risk for compression or rupture. And here are examples. This is the normal cord insertion coming from around the middle of the placenta. Here's the placenta in back, and this is the edge of it, or the margin of it, and the cord is coming off right at the margin. It's a marginal uh, cord insertion. And here's a velamentous cord insertion. The placenta comes, the cord comes off somewhere around here, but then instead of going right into the amniotic fluid, it travels under the membranes, and then uh, only later does it come into the amniotic fluid. This part is at risk for rupture or compression. With a velamentous cord insertion, if the, since the membrane travels for, the cord travels for a while under the membranes away from the placenta, if it happens to, uh, during its course under the membranes, go over the cervix, it's called a vasa previa. You can also get a vasa previa when there are two lobes of the placenta and the part of the um, blood vessels that connect them, if that travels over the cervix, that's a vasa previa. With a vasa previa, uh, it can have very serious compl uh, complications. Uh, the, the, if, uh, the, if a vaginal delivery is attempted, the vessels can tear during delivery, which could lead to fetal hemorrhage, and in severe cases, fetal exsanguination and death. We make the ultrasound diagnosis when we see a vessel over the cervix that is fetal, it has a fetal heart rate as opposed to a maternal heart rate, and if you're not sure whether it's held there under the membranes or it just happens to be lying there, sitting there during the time, repeat the ultrasound a few minutes later or, if necessary, at a later date. And here's an example of vasa previa. There's the placenta, cor the cord coming off, and then going under the membrane, so it's a velamentous cord insertion, and then extends right over the cervix. That's a vasa previa. The final abnormalities that we can diagnose by ultrasound, it's important to recognize them if they're there, are umbilical cord presentation and umbilical cord prolapse. Cord presentation is when there's a loop of cord that lies um, below the presenting part of the fetus in the presence of the intact membranes. Uh, and cord prolapse, which is much more important, is when the umbilical cord protrudes through ruptured membranes into the vagina, usually during labor. And that can lead to fetal hypoxia and fetal morbidity and mortality. And here's a case of prolapsed cord. You can see that there's fluid extending through an open cervix here. and into the vagina, and the cord is coming through.
um, this uh, area, so it's prolapse of the umbilical cord. The last thing that I'll talk about is ultrasound of amniotic fluid. Here the questions are, are there too much, too little, or is it too bright? Um, amniotic fluid, it, it's important to know a little bit about the source and the regulation of amniotic fluid. Up to about 16 weeks, amniotic fluid uh, it, it occurs as a result of diffusion of fluid through the membranes, the placenta, the umbilical cord, and the fetal skin. That's early in pregnancy. But from 16 weeks onward, the amniotic fluid is produced largely by fetal urination and consumed by fetal swallowing and GI tract absorption. Um, uh, also, to some extent, by lung absorption. The reason this is worth knowing is that if there's a production problem, fetal uh, urine isn't being produced or uh, there's obstruction, bilateral obstruction to blood flow. If there's a production problem, you'll have oligohydramnios. If there's a consumption problem, um, uh, you will have, such as um, with uh, esophageal atresia, where the baby can't swallow the fluid and therefore consume it in its, uh, uh, in its GI tract, there will be polyhydramnios. Pictorially, uh, amniotic fluid is produced by fetal urination. There's a boy and a girl peeing, and uh, here is uh, consumption is by swallowing and getting the fluid down into the GI tract. If we ever wanted to know amniotic fluid volume, we can't tell it directly by ultrasound. The method to determine amniotic fluid volume accurately, in fact, is by a method called dye dilution. What we, do, what we could do for this, and we rarely do it, um, there's rarely a reason to do it, but if you had to know how many cc's of fluid there is in the, in the um, uh, pregnancy, what you would do would be to inject some concentrated dye, put a needle into the fluid, inject some dye, and then wait a few minutes as the mother rolls around or walks around, let the dye distribute itself evenly through the amniotic fluid, then put a needle back in and take a little out and see how much it's been diluted. If you put in one centimeter, sorry, if you put in one cc or one milliliter, and then the next time you stick the needle in a few minutes later, it's diluted that one a thousandfold, then the fact that one milliliter got diluted a thousandfold means that there's a thousand milliliters or a thousand cc's in the, uh, of amniotic fluid. That's the only way to get actual numbers or actual volumes of fluid, and people have done such studies with uh, dye dilution to get the actual uh, median or average um, amniotic fluid volume at different stages of pregnancy. It ma it, it's maximum in the late uh, third trimester where it hits uh, almost a thousand cc's median and then begins to drop off a little bit. Amniotic fluid in the first trimester, uh, the, uh, uh, the, it's important to know what it looks like and how much there is. Normally in the early first trimester, there is little or no amniotic fluid because the amnion is closely applied to the embryo itself. This little yellow area may be a little amniotic fluid. Most is this green chorionic fluid between the amnion and the chorion. By the mid to late first trimester, you can see about equal amounts of amniotic fluid, which is yellow here, and chorionic fluid. Uh, and then by the end of the first trimester or early second trimester, the fluid is virtually all amniotic fluid. And here's a progression at six weeks. You can see the yolk sac, the embryo, but no uh, amnion is seen because it's right up against the baby. So there's no amniotic fluid. All this fluid is chorionic fluid. At seven weeks, a little amniotic fluid, a lot of chorionic fluid. At eight weeks, a little more amniotic fluid, more at nine, 10, 11. By 12 weeks, it's almost completely um, uh, almost all the fluid is amniotic fluid because the amnion is almost up against the chorion. And generally, by the end of the first trimester or beginning of the second, uh, all this chorionic fluid's gone and all the fluid you see is amniotic. Uh, 
In the second and third trimesters, there are two features of the amniotic fluid that are relevant. One is its echogenicity or brightness, and the other is the amniotic fluid volume. I'll talk about both of those before ending. Uh, let's first talk about bright amniotic fluid. There are a few different etiologies or causes of bright amniotic fluid. One, which is common, is physiologic etiology. Vernix, which are the little white flakes that you see on a baby's skin after it's born, those little flakes break off and float around in the amniotic fluid, causing bright reflectors and uh, bright amniotic fluid. That's physiologic, non-pathological. There are also a number of pathologic causes of echogenic amniotic fluid, including blood, meconium, or pus, purulent fluid, as with chorioamnionitis. So the key question to address is, should we ever worry when we see echogenic amniotic fluid? Well, in the third trimester, so here, uh, here a uh, report of a couple of studies, or results of a couple of studies that have been done. In the third trimester, echogenic fluid is due to vernix in well over 90% of cases. So whenever you see bright fluid in the, second, in the third trimester, uh, you should always assume it's vernix, unless there's a very strong clinical suspicion of blood, meconium, or infection. In the second trimester, uh, you have to strongly consider a pathologic cause, especially if the fluid is very echogenic. So just uh, examples. Here are two different, 20, uh, two different second trimester pregnancies with echogenic amniotic fluid. Here are actually twins at 21 weeks. The one, you can see normal fluid and bright fluid. This woman was having fever and pain clinically suspected of having chorioamnionitis, and we did an amniocentesis, but we were pretty sure that was going to turn out to be infected, and sure enough, it came out with uh, a lot of pus. Here is another case of echogenic amniotic fluid here at 18 weeks, and this is blood in the amniotic fluid. On the other hand, these are two uh, third trimester fetuses at 25 weeks, at 37 weeks. In both cases, you see small, bright particles floating around in the fluid. In both of these cases, we would assume it to be vernix, unless there's a strong clinical suspicion that it might be blood, meconium, or infection. But in the absence of that clinical suspicion, we would just say, it's vernix, it's normal. The last thing I'll talk about is uh, uh, assessing amniotic fluid volume in the second and third trimester. And here what we're trying to do is not get the exact volume of the fluid, but categorize it as polyhydramnios or oligohydramnios or normal. Uh, this is a case of polyhydramnios. Here's a case of oligohydramnios. How do we characterize it? Um, according to the uh, guidelines of the American Institute of Ultrasound in Medicine for second and third trimester obstetrical ultrasound, and similarly for American College of Radiology or American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology guidelines, they state that a qualitative or semi-quantitative estimate of amniotic fluid volume should be reported. And they're saying that it's acceptable to uh, use either qualitative estimate or semi-quantitative estimates, such as the amniotic fluid index, single deepest pocket, or two diameter pocket. These, uh, such as the amniotic fluid index, are semi-quantitative. The only real quantitative method would be the dilution method I mentioned earlier, which are not uh, done on uh, any regular basis in ultrasound. So the sonographic assessment can use subjective assessment, single deepest pocket measurement, or the amniotic fluid index, which is the sum of the deepest pocket in the four quadrants. Single deepest pocket is considered to be oligohydramnios if it's uh, less than one or two centimeters, and poly if greater than eight. The amniotic fluid index in uh, uh, approximately less than Five centimeters is oligo, greater than 18 to 20 is polyhydramnios. Here is uh, 
case, uh, two different cases normal, of normal amniotic fluid volume. We're sweeping through, and uh, so this is, it looks subjectively normal, and when we do an amniotic fluid index on a normal case, we're getting 12.4 millimeters. Uh, here, subjectively, there's very little fluid as we sweep through. And here you can, that's confirmed by an amniotic fluid index of 4.2 less than 5, which is oligohydramnios. And here is a case uh, of polyhydramnios when we sweep through, especially towards the end of the sweep before it re you see more fluid than you would expect at 30 weeks, and the amniotic fluid index is also elevated. So what are the, uh, which one should you use? Uh, subjective assessment is quick and efficient, accounts for gestational age variations um, in uh, the amniotic fluid. The, the only uh, potential downside is it may be of questionable reliability with uh, an experienced operator. Um, it is best documented, as I showed you in the prior uh, uh, slides, with a video clip. The single deepest pocket or amniotic fluid index is simple and quick, especially the single deepest, but even the amniotic fluid index is pretty simple and quick. Um, but these have a number, these are the semi-quantitative methods, they have a number of problems. Even with oligohydramnios, you can have one or more deep pockets that don't have much fluid in them, such as uh, in crevices, uh, um, in the fetal neck or between the fetal legs. The amniotic fluid index can be affected by fetal movement from one quadrant to another. Uh, and another problem with these semi-quantitative methods, they're not really mathematically uh, valid. Linear measurements do not correlate with volume. And this uh, is a schematic uh, indicator of why that's true. Here are two different uh, uh, pictures or diagrams of two different people. They have the same linear measurement uh, if you measure height, but they have very different volumes. So um, linear measurements do not correlate with volume. So which method should you use? Well, uh, there have been a couple of uh, published studies that have used dye dilution as the gold standard and then comparing the gold standard to subjective assessment or amniotic fluid index. And what these studies have found is that there's really no significant difference between subjective assessment and amniotic fluid index when you compare it to the gold standard. So either of them are about as good as the other. But unfortunately, neither of them is terribly accurate at diagnosing elevated or decreased fluid volume. So they're not great, but they're all we have. So you should always assess fluid, and you can either use subjective assessment and amniotic fluid index. Uh, either one of them is acceptable. So I've come to the end of the tour of uh, amniotic fluid volume, uh, as well as uh, the uh, placenta and umbilical cord. Uh, I hope you found it uh, useful and educational. Thank you. Bye-bye.